Hey kids, my name's Jake, and welcome to Jake's Adventure. I want to take you guys on an adventure through Texas history. First, let me introduce you to my buddy Carly. She loves a good adventure. Look, here she comes now. Hey Jake, what's going on? Oh, hey everybody. Jake, did you tell everybody about the game that's going on during the adventure? Oh no, I didn't. We should tell them the rules of how it works. Your teacher is going to hand out some colored index cards. Make sure everyone gets a set. If you look on one side of the card, you'll see a letter A, B, C, or D. Make sure you all are ready for the adventure when you hear this sound. <coughs> the game begins. A question will pop up with a multiple choice answer. All you need to do is hold up the card you think is correct. If you think your answer is correct, then write the question number on the opposite side of the card. Okay, now you know the rules of the game. Let's settle up and get ready for our adventure. Let's start off in the mid-1700s. People still believed in having a king. This period is where people thought that God gave the king the right to rule, otherwise known as the divine right of kings. But then people began to challenge this belief with science and logic. This caused people to get uneasy. This period was also known as the Enlightenment. Now we're in the period of Father Hidalgo calling for independence. Father Hidalgo was an important person to Mexico gaining independence. He gave a speech called the Grito de Dolores, which rallied people to believe that Mexico could be independent from Spain. In 1811, Hidalgo was captured by the Spanish guards and executed. However, his dreams for Mexico's independence never died. Okay, you know what time it is. Here's your question. What was the theory called that gave the king God's consent to rule? A. The Divine Right of Kings. B. Taco Tuesday. C. Charles Williams. And D. The Enlightenment. Okay, everybody. Hold your answers up. Okay, kids, don't forget to write down the question number on the back of your card before we move on. Now we're in the period of Father Hidalgo calling for independence. Father Hidalgo was an important person to Mexico gaining independence. He gave a speech called Grito de Dolores, which rallied people to believe that Mexico could be independent from Spain. In 1811, Hidalgo was captured by the Spanish guards and executed. However, his dreams for Mexico's independence never died. Later that year, Hidalgo's supporters led a group of rebels to overthrow Spanish control in San Antonio. Once overthrown, they named the town Las Casas, and then took control of La Bahia and Nacogdoches. Later that year, on January 22nd, Las Casas declared itself independent in Spain. Hidalgo's followers continued to fight for independence years after his death. After Juan Batista died, Jose Bernardo Gutierrez left Navarro standard and fled to Louisiana, reestablished an army. Gutierrez and his army commander, Augustus McGee, marched back to Texas and briefly took control before being defeated by Spain. Meanwhile, in Spain, a group of liberals staged a revolt, and in 1820, they forced the king to make changes that frightened the conservatives in Mexico. The conservatives had opposed independence, but the revolution in Spain changed their minds. They joined with Father Hidalgo's followers to defeat Spanish forces. On August 24, 1821, a treaty was signed making Mexico independent from Spain. Though Texas is independent from Spain, much of the Spanish influence lives on today, such as rivers, cities, landforms, foods, and everyday items remind us of Texas's Spanish heritage. Question number two. When did Mexico gain its independence from Spain and become its own country? A. August 24th, 1821. B. On St. Patrick's Day. C. 4th of July. D. April 29th, 1820.
Okay, kids, don't forget to write down the question number on the back of your card before we move on. Now let's take a look at the surge of immigration to Texas. We'll start off with Moses Austin. He was born in Connecticut in 1761, and during his business dealings, he developed a keen interest in mining. After learning of George Morgan's colony in what is now Missouri, Austin moved to operate a lead mine. Austin traveled to Texas in 1820 with an ambitious plan in mind. He wanted to bring 300 families from the United States to Texas. Austin traveled 800 miles for approval from Spanish officials. Once he reached San Antonio, he confronted Governor Antonio Martinez with a signed petition. Martinez strictly followed Spanish policies and had to reject Austin's petition. The Spanish officials had seen too many filibusters try to seize Spanish lands before. Disappointed, Austin prepared to leave Texas. Little did he know that his luck was about to change. Austin informed an old friend of his, Baron de Bastrop, of his plans and Baron agreed to influence the Spanish officials to help Austin win their approval. Bastrop arranged another meeting with Martinez who agreed to send Austin's request to a higher authority. Already expecting a positive decision, Austin then returned to the East to begin recruiting colonists for Texas. Austin had become very ill and was dying when he learned that his plans had On been On his approved. deathbed, Austin asked his son Stephen to carry out his dream of colonizing Texas. At a young age of 27, Stephen F. Austin's father died in 1821. Stephen set aside his dreams of becoming a lawyer and set to Texas to fulfill his father's dreams. Stephen was born in Virginia and raised on the frontier. After attending Transylvania University in Kentucky, he served as a legislator for six years and briefly as a judge in Arkansas. Despite Stephen's youth, he proved to be the perfect person to make his father's vision a reality. Stephen Austin's first act was to visit San Antonio and meet with Governor Martinez. Erasimo Seguin, a well-known and respected citizen of San Antonio, had been appointed by Governor Martinez to help Austin. On August 1821, Seguin escorted Austin into the city. Governor Martinez legally transferred Moses Austin's grant to his son Stephen's name. Then, Austin had to choose a sign for his colony. After looking over the area, Austin chose land between the Lavaca and San Jacinto rivers. It seemed like the perfect location, unlike the heavily forested lands of eastern Texas. It would be easy enough to clear, and unlike West Texas, it received enough rainfall to raise crops. The grassy prairie provided a good place for settlers to grow sugarcane, cotton, corn, and other crops that they were all familiar with. Austin determined that the first settlement would be settled along the lower Colorado River. After deciding the colony's location, Austin traveled to New Orleans to recruit his colonists. He knew that the colony relied on the character of the colonist. By the term of the impresarial grant, colonists had to be of good character and had to either be Catholic or agree to become Catholic. Austin also looked for people who were willing to accept hard times. Colonists were required to pledge their loyalty to Spain as shown in the following record of two Texas set settlers, Samuel Davenport and William Barr, the impresarial grant allowed Austin to bring 300 families to Texas. These families were known as the Old 300. Settlers that were farmers received 177 acres of land. Those who raised cattle received 4,428 acres of land. And many settlers received both. After Stephen Austin made sure that the colonists were qualified, Baron de Bastrop's government's agent, gave land titles to the, all the colonists. In the beginning of 1821, settlers began to arrive. Some traveled through Nacogdoches along the El Camino Rill, and others came by boat. Stephen Austin purchased a small boat named the Lively to help transport colonists to the mouth of the Colorado River. However, miscommunication caused a problem. Instead of the Colorado River, they were transported to the Brazo River. Austin waited at the Brazo River, but some settlers gave up and decided to return home. Who was the name of the group that Austin brought over to Texas that had 300 families? A. The 50 soldiers. B. The old 300. C. 
Cowboys of Texas, and D, the Lone Wolves. Many impresarios had opened the door to Texas, and it had opened the door for opportunity to many colonists. As an abundant amount of people poured westward into the gates of Texas, the letter GTT became a common sight across the abandoned cabins. The letters GTT mean gone to Texas, which also states the previous family of the house had packed up and moved to Texas or beyond the Sabine and Red River. The reason many people had left Texas is to escape their problems in America. Some even left for adventure. Many people also left because there was plentiful and inexpensive lands. The contrast of land was a large part of the colonists buying the land, and the land was 12.5 cents per acre, and the price could be paid out for several years. Colonists often came through the Tennessee and Ohio rivers because the rivers flow into the Mississippi River. Traveling along the river with boats was often used because it was much easier than traveling by foot on land. Some families followed the trail that stretched southward from Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas through Kentucky, Tennessee, and Arkansas into Texas. Some often came from Missouri, and others traveled westward through the southern states of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Colonists coming through Texas often traveled by horseback, and the rest walked because they lacked oxen or horse, and they often lacked a wagon. People who had horses generally had a covered wagon, a boat, or traveled on foot. This limited the supplies they could bring with them. Most immigrants were coming on foot and could carry no more than a rifle for protection and hunting, extra ammunition, salt to flavor and preserve their food, and perhaps a few extra clothes. Those who rode on horses could bring even more tools and supplies, especially if they brought a pack horse. Immigrants who had wagons could bring even more supplies, but they usually walked beside the wagon so the wagons could be used to carry all the supplies they could pack. Other colonists floated their belongings down the river on rafts or boats. Question number four. What caused many people to go to Texas and establish their lives there? A. Cheap land and plentiful resources. B. To avoid the vicious natives. C. To avoid rabid animals. D. To avoid a hurricane. Okay guys, don't forget to write down the number to your question on the back of your card. The settlers of colonial Texas were varied, as well as the routes they traveled. Even though most immigrated from the U.S., others also came from Mexico and Europe. Early Texas colonists generally varied from German, Irish, Polish, Mexican, and African descendants, among others. A large portion of the population of the Tejanos settled in San Antonio and along the Rio Grande. Martin de Leon founded the first of many Tejano colonies in Texas. Other powerful Tejanos in Texas were the Erasimo and the Juan Seguin, Lorenzo de Zavala, and Jose Antonio Navarra. The African American population steadily increased as Texas grew. Many enslaved African Americans were bought by settlers from Southern America.